days when we didn't have any recording. I remember whenever I went to meetings, I would be so excited and I would be fully prepared. I make sure that I have my notepad and my pen, everything. I don't want to miss anything. And even today, I'm, I'm like that. You notice that the first time you listen to something, it's very, very powerful. Of course, there's power in reinforcement. But the first time that you listen to a message, that, that time is very, very important. So we're talking about winning prayers, and uh, we know that we all pray, and I know that I'm talking to mature Christians tonight. And um, prayer is very, very important. It's one of the pillars in your life, and it's one of the vital ingredients to your success in Christ Jesus. And, uh, but one thing that is very, very important, because we're living so busy today, our life is very busy, it seems that we're always like, running out of time. And I believe that as far as the Lord is concerned, he's not like a slow person anymore. He, he understands the time frame that we're in and the generation that we're in. And the Bible, that's why the Bible has already told us that he's going to do a quick work. And a quick work will he do. So it won't take you forever to get into the presence of God. It won't take you forever to pray. And that's why you need to get some tips. And you, that's why you need to know the ways. So that's what I'm sharing with you tonight. And one thing that's very, very important is that when it comes to prayer, uh, it's true that sometimes you're in a hurry and you need to pray very quickly, and sometimes you're pressed out of time and you need to pray quickly, but all that has to be backed up by a lifestyle of prayer. You notice that a lot of times Wednesday morning when I came into the prayer meeting, I'm already about to go. It's just like because I've been running for so long. I've been preparing myself in the morning. And on my way to church, to the prayer meeting, I've been pray praying when I'm driving. So as soon as I hit this room, I'm ready to go. And that's why you notice the prayers would just come out of me like that. But I want you to understand that it does not just happen. It's because you've been running like that. It's like there has been a momentum that has already been set up in your life. That you are a seasoned prayer warrior. That's why it's very, very important. It does take time to get into the things of God. It does take time to get into the presence of God. And this is one thing that... I want to explain and to teach tonight because when I first, when I was a Christian in the very beginning, I thought that I had to struggle very hard to get into the presence of God. I thought that I had to fast and to pray maybe an hour before I would get into the presence of God. And sometimes I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel the presence. Sometimes I thought maybe because, you know, there's sin in my life or, or because, you know, I didn't pray hard en enough or I didn't fast enough. And now, you know, having been a Christian for so many years and walking with the Lord for so many years, I've learned something. And um, that's what I want to share with you tonight. And uh, that's what we're teaching tonight is on the vital ingredients of having a successful prayer life, which is the presence Because people are God. too busy. And that's why the Bible talks about that you have to offer your life as a living sacrifice. It's not when God is convenient for you. You'll notice that when God starts to move, there will be some sacrifices that you have to make. If you don't ever want to make sacrifices, you'll never get into the presence of God. When, the, when, when God moves powerfully... You have to be willing to make sacrifices. And remember, those that follow Jesus, they were called disciples. Another word for disciples would be the disciplined ones. If you are somebody who is always very busy in and out doing different things, and you don't have time for God, then you are not his disciple. For somebody who is a disciple, is somebody who puts God first. Mark your calendar and put God first. If you're doing too much, then get rid of what you're doing. Don't do so much. You need to simplify your life in order that your calendar can be filled, filled with the presence of God, filled with the time that you have for God. And here is this what I'm saying. Remember, David said in the book of Psalms, his prayer, take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Cast me not from your presence, O oh God, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. I want you to know that this prayer has been answered. Now, when you read your Bible, you need to understand that there are some prayers that were prayed in the Old Testament that had been answered. Prayers prayed by Jesus that had been answered. So you don't pray the same prayers anymore. So you don't pray like, take not thy Holy Spirit away from me, because the Holy Spirit will never be taken away from you. Because the calling of God is without repentance. That means God does not change his mind. And that's why even in the, in the Christian circle, you notice that sometimes we come across some ministers, they were moving powerfully in the gifts when they were sinning. And then you wonder, why? Why were they sinning and moving in the gifts? Because the Holy Spirit would not be taken from you anymore. Because the calling and the gifts of God are without repentance. So you don't pray those prayers anymore. You don't pray, God, don't take your presence away from me anymore. Because the key is that as a New Testament believer, by the ministry of Jesus and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you already have his presence. It's very, very important that you know. So you don't Wait for an hour to get into the presence of God. You don't wait for even 30 minutes to get into the presence of God. How do I get into the presence of God? By faith. By faith, you get into the presence of God. By faith, you get into the presence of God. It's so important that we understand. And yet there are times that you will find it a lot easier and quicker to get into the presence of God. Like, for example, Wednesday prayer, mo prayer meeting, I find it very easy to get into the presence of God. Why? Because there's a corporate anointing. Sunday, you will find that it's very easy to get into the presence of God. Why? There is a corporate anointing. Friday night, there's, it's very easy to get into the presence of God because there's a corporate anointing. There's a holy congregation. It's when people congregate on purpose, sacrificially, to get into the presence of God for a definite purpose. Because we have to understand that God is very, very expensive. Because he's the one who told us not to cast our pearls before the swine. So he will not cast his pearls before the swine. So he wants to be treated and honored as somebody who is very, very precious. And his gifts as very, very expensive. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Very important that we understand that. Amen. So it's true that in and of ourselves, individually, we can get into the presence of God. But there is another presence, there is another anointing that we need to get into that comes through the corporate anointing, that comes through the assembly of God's people together called the ecclesia. Another thing that can get you very, very quickly into the presence of God is your calling. You'll notice that in the Old Testament, like Samson, like Daniel, in the Old Testament, like Nehemiah, like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, they quickly got into the presence of God. Why? Because of the calling upon their life. So that's why it pays to serve God. When you serve God and get into His, His uh, divine assignment, then His calling will come upon you. Why? To get the job done. And the reason why when you get into church, you get into the calling, you get into the anointing, is because the church is God's institution. God is the one who instituted the church. God is the one who started the church. And that's why, of course, there is an anointing upon the church. That's why the Word of God says, do not forsake the assembling. Of yourselves together. And that's why it is your essential need. It is your vital need to come to church and come to church early with expectancy, with honor. Come in, discipline your time, mark the time at least 20 minutes before church service starts. Now we come to the subjective 
the presence of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, What know you not, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. So the Bible is telling us that the presence of God is in you. You are the temple of God. The presence of God is in you. Or put it this way, you host the presence. You carry the presence so that wherever you go, you release that presence. You are his channel. You are his carrier. So we're talking about objectively at the macro level and also subjectively at the micro level. So as far as objectively at the macro level is concerned, when the people of God gather together, God releases his presence on this congregation for his special purpose. And yet subjectively, individually, we all host the presence of God. That's why David said in Psalm 63, verse 1 and 2, Psalm 63, verse 1 and 2, you, every one of us, need to study Psalm 63. If you want to have a successful Christian life, it's not just you go to church and then you pray a few prayers and go home and live your way. No, because God is not a four-faced Buddha. You know, the Chinese worship is that you go to a temple, you say a few prayers, and then you go home and live your way out of the consciousness of God. No, no. Christianity is you have the consciousness of God all the time. In Him, you live and move and have your being. So you carry that consciousness and you live in that consciousness all the time, all the time. You don't just go to church and say a few prayers and then go home. No. You carry that. That's why I told you there is the macro level and there is the micro level. Objective, objectively, you're living in his presence. Subjectively, you're carrying his presence. And David said in Psalm 63, verse 1 and 2, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land, where no water is. Things, as far as God is concerned, this world is a dry and thirsty land. This is wilderness compared to heaven. So don't think that you're living in heaven. No, you are not living in heaven. You're living in the wilderness. A dry and thirsty land. But the sad thing is, a lot of us, we're not conscious of that. And then we make this world like our time, our engagements all the time. And it's like you lose the major for the minor. Don't lose the major for the minor. Don't lose the essential for the distractions. Can we say amen? And if you look at this scripture again, Oh God, you are my God. You need to possess God for yourself. Yes, he's the God of the whole universe. He's the God of the church. You need to possess him for yourself. This is the only place where you can be possessive. You, God wants you to possess him. That's why he has made you the temple of his Holy Spirit. For you to possess him. So that's why David said, Oh God, you are my God. This is very important. This is a possessive noun. You are my God. That means I need to see you in my business. I need to see you in my family. I need to see you in my body. I need to see you in my mind. I need to see you in everything that I do. I need to see you in my marriage because you are my God. That is the success of David. He's very sincere. He's very genuine. He's very, very practical, even though he lived in the Old Testament. You have to understand that in the Old Testament, they lived by the commandments. They lived by the tabernacle. It seemed like it's getting, hopping in and out of God's presence. But no, David got the presence of God all the time. And to him, he felt it. To him, it's so important. He realized the importance of that. And that's why he said, take 
me knocked away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. That's why he prayed that prayer. Praise the Lord for his prayer. Because David prayed that prayer. We got the answer to that prayer. The Holy Spirit himself. Cast me not away from your presence, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. David prayed that prayer by the unction of the Holy Ghost. Why? So that the New Testament church can get into it and never lose it. Can we say amen? He said, you are my God. And then he made up his mind. There's this Holy Ghost determination. You know why there are Christians that fail all the time? Because their heart is not wholehearted. You're changing your mind all the time, in and out. You don't put God first. He's not the most important in your life. He's not all that you need. You need God plus this, plus that, plus that, plus that, plus that, plus, 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 plus. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You need God plus a good job, plus a good income, plus this, plus that. Jesus, you're all that I need. He is. You have him, you have all things. You have his mind, you have all things. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. Number one, desire. Desire his presence. Desire. Make his presence your desire. Amen. Church, we must not make money our desire. We must not make the success of this world our desire. Make his presence your desire. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. Amen. Stir up that desire within you. Stir up that desire within you. When I first got born again, that's the one thing that I seek after, the presence of God. Because I became so dramatically different and I knew it. I knew it. I knew it that I was different when I got saved. Amen. This is very, very important. Oh God, you are my God. And David said, Early will I seek you. Now, how many of you think that David is very, very, um, <laughs> like, he's, he has a lot of time on his hand? How many of you think that? <laughs> how many of you think that David has retired and he has a lot of time on his hand and, you know, he uh, has nothing else to do and that's why he can spend so much time with God? No, <laughs> not at all. Number one, at first he was a warrior, a soldier. And uh, after that, he became a what? A fugitive. He was running away from Saul all the time. And at one point, he had to pretend to be mad, to be crazy. So much so that he's dripping with saliva. And then he became a king. And the first period of his reign, he was constantly battling because there were people still coming against him. And then when he became a king, he had a lot to do. How many of us understand that a king is always very busy? We're talking about David. I mean, somebody who's conscious of his calling. So we're now talking about don't disengage yourself from the practicality of Christianity. Don't think that you must have a lot of time on your hand to be a good Christian. That is a lie. It is just a matter of choice. It is a matter of choice. It is a matter of your priority. One thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after. Early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. You can interpret it in two things. One is early in the morning. And another thing is that whenever you have a problem, that's the first thing that you go to. God. I have to admit it, sometimes I do it myself. Like when we have a problem, a lot of time we try to solve it ourselves. We think, we argue, we think, we rationalize, we reason. And then when we can't do anything, let's pray. The order should be God first and then get his answers and his solutions. That will save us a lot of time and a lot of money, a lot of effort. Amen. I don't want to have an Ishmael in my life. That's the last thing that you want. You don't want an Ishmael. An Ishmael, something that you've started and it's not from God. And it caused you a lot of problems. So lift up our hands and say, God, I don't want any Ishmael in my life. Very, very important. Amen? We want Isaac. 
Isaac started with God, started from God's promise. God's promise to Abraham. God's promise to Sarah. And then they waited on the promise. They believed in the promise. And then God made a way for the promise to come to pass. God himself had to make a way. Not you make a way. Ishmael was born of the flesh. They made a way. Sarah suggested to Abraham, make a way for God's promise to come to pass. No, God doesn't need our help. He is always the one to initiate and then we follow. And that's why the presence is so important. The unction is so important because you must listen to God and don't start anything yourself. It may sound very good. It may sound very, very excellent. It may sound well. But if it's not birthed by God, if it's not initiated by God, it won't come to fruition. And in fact, it can become very time-consuming. It can become very destructive. So it's very, very important. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that everything birthed by God is a smooth sail. Because you do have to press. But what I'm talking about is following the unction. What I'm talking about is following the cloud. Amen? Following the smoke. What I'm talking about is following God. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Even prayers. How do we pray successfully? By following Him. Your prayers won't come to anything if you don't follow Him. You must follow Him in your prayers. How do I pray? I get an unction. I get a prompting. I pray it out. If you don't have an unction, don't have a prompting, how do you pray? Yes, you can give your petitions, but everything that you do, even your petitions, you have to do it by the Holy Spirit. I will get into that later. It's very, very important. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. Now, we have to pray. Like I myself pray. I say, Lord, help me to thirst for you. Help me to long for you. Because we we can get so busy that we keep just running and then we don't get into the thirsting after God. Especially when everything goes right or you're so busy. And you think that, oh, everything's right. But one thing that is very, very important, I understand that it's the key ingredient to success and it's the key ingredient to my walk with God is that hungering and thirsting after God. It's very, very important. It's as important as your physical appetite because if you don't have any appetite, you will die. And spiritual appetite is even more important than physical appetite. Very, very important. That's the answer that David is giving in verse 2. Why? To see your power and your glory. Now, I want you to look at the sequence. It's just like a programmer. The sequence is very important. Without one, you don't get to two, right? The programmer here. Isn't that right, Rudy? Yeah, there's a sequence, right? Without one, you don't get to two. Without two, you don't get to three. So, the same with God. You must have one to get to two. His presence, then you see his glory and his power. Very, very important. Now, the other day when I was using the OneDrive with my computer, the Lord spoke to me. You know, the fact that we are now so used to something in the air. You know, now you can just put everything into the air. You can do the cloud, you can do the OneDrive, you can do SkyDrive, you can do everything. It's like you get used to putting something in the air. It's like your dedicated server, and then you can download it. And like right away, it flashes in me that we have a server with God. And when we pray, when we worship, when we live unto Him, you have a server with God. That's in your name. That's unique to you. And then from that server, you can download. That's why the Bible talks about you need to have a storage with God. That's why you notice that a new Christian is different from a seasoned Christian. Like when, you've just start to, when you, you have just started to serve God, it's different from somebody who has served God for 30 years, 40 years. And that's why the Bible talks about generational blessings when your parents serve God and your grandparents serve God and your great-grandparents serve God. You have built up like a great server. You have to understand that we're living in the end times and people are getting used to like working with something that they don't see. 
In the past, we have to work with something that we can see. But now, we are being programmed to work with something that we don't see. Because we have to understand that the world is also progressively moving towards the end times. And the Bible does talk about lying signs and wonders. So people, in general, in general, we're getting more and more spiritual. We're getting more and more conscious of something is happening in the atmosphere. But that's another, another lesson. We'll get to that later. To see your power and your glory, so as I've seen you, where? In the sanctuary. So you see the connection between your private life and your public life. The connection between the micro and the macro. The connection between the private anointing and the public anointing. That's why David said in Psalm 63, the same psalm, you really have to read Psalm 63. Psalm 63, the same psalm, verse 8. My soul follows hard after you. Not my spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is already in your spirit. But your soul does have to follow hard after God. Your soul doesn't want to get up in the morning to pray. Your soul gets lazy. Your soul gets into the, th the ways of the world. So your soul does have to follow hard after God. Your soul is filled with unbelief. So we have to command our soul to operate in faith. All this requires what? Discipline. As you discipline yourself, you grow into the new man. Greater and greater higher and higher that's why the bible says put off the old man and put on the new man nobody can do it for you but yourself and let me tell you that all that you're doing will not be wasted because the same anointing you will take with you to heaven in heaven not everyone is going to be the same i, I won't cheat myself i won't be the same as the apostle paul Neither will you be the same as the Peter, the apostle. So what you do on earth does count. There are things that you can't do in heaven that you have to do on earth. That's why Jesus had to come to earth. So important. Thank you, Lord. When we talk about the presence, you can get into the presence of God just now. I've told you different ways. And another way is to get into the Word. Because the Word and the presence of God, they are inseparable. When you get into the Word, you get into the presence by faith right away. Amen? And also how to get into the presence of God by praying in tongues. The minute you go, you get into the presence of the Holy Spirit. You get into the presence of the Holy Spirit by heartfelt, affectionate praise and worship. As you praise and worship God from your heart, affectionately, you get into his presence. You must put your calling above all things. I went through the time when I had to put my calling above my family. That's not easy. I had to put my calling above my children. I had to put my calling above my husband. That's not easy, but I did that. And now I reap all the benefits of putting God first. Amen. It's very, very important. A lot of people, they've lost their calling because they've put other things first. The, the, the key is that when you put people first, then you follow people. When you put God first, you follow God. And it's very easy to be distracted and you get into compromise. And, and the devil can, and can talk you into a lie. And you say, that, well, I have to do this for my kids. I have to do this for my, for my spouse. And you, you get, get into the guilt trap. Don't do anything by guilt. I want you to understand that God does not talk by guilt. When you hear the voice of guilt talking to you, that's the devil. Whenever God talks, he's like a matter of fact. When he says something... Even when it's a conviction, he doesn't talk in such a way that he manipulates my feelings. I've heard God many times. He does not talk in such a way that he manipulates my emotions. He does not put guilt on anyone. When God talks, it's like a matter of fact. And then he leaves it to you to choose to follow up. It's still your choice. Amen? Very, very important. 
very, very important. I remember I was, um, when was it? Wednesday morning. Wednesday, yes. Wednesday morning. When I woke up in the morning, I just heard God speak to me very, very clearly. And he said, you can live like God. I said, what? Yeah, he said, yeah, you can live like God. I said, what do you mean? And then he said, how do I live? I said, you live by your word. He said, he asked me again, how do I live? I said, you live by principles. That's it. He said, you live by principles. And right away I got it. Yeah, that means I live by the principles in the word of God. And then I won't be manipulated by feelings. Right away I got it. And I become so excited. Amen. God speaks. God speaks. Amen. He will talk to you. He speaks. Amen. That's another lesson. Okay. <laughs> the Word and the Holy Spirit, they are inseparable. Inseparable. The Word and the presence of God, they are inseparable. The Word and success, they are inseparable. Just like scriptures and tongues. Amen. Heartfelt, affectionate, God-conscious praise and worship. That's very, very important. Amen. Heartfelt, affectionate, God-conscious praise and worship. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Very, very important. Let me give you some signs that you will know that you have the presence of God in your life. Now, when I say that you have the presence of God in your life, what I'm talking about is that you are in the presence of God already. So you don't have to pray to be in the presence of God. Okay? But I'm talking about the presence of God being real to you and the presence of God being uh, tangible to you and the presence of God being effective in your life. Number one, the presence of God, how do I say it uh, in a way that you understand? It's like you can grow in the consciousness of God's pre presence. You can grow in the consciousness of God's presence. You can grow in the manifestation of God's presence. Okay? So I'm giving you a few signs that you can discern how much of God's presence I'm manifesting. Number one, your character transformation. I know and I know that I carry and I manifest the powerful presence of God by my character transformation. When I find that my character is being transformed all the time, that I don't get annoyed when I fail, I don't get upset with people, but I see it as a learning curve, and I'm learning, I'm growing. That's how I know I carry the presence of God strongly. Your character transformation. Number two, how do I know? Is that you have a life of meaning and direction. Your life becomes meaningful to you, and there is a sense of direction in your innermost being. Money is secondary importance to you. Money is only a tool to fulfill God's calling on your life. Amen. That's how you know that you carry the presence of God. Your life becomes meaningful and your life has a direction to it. You become a servant. You have a strong desire to serve, to witness, a desire to be an activist for Jesus. An activist for Jesus. The other day when I was uh, reading an article, um, you know, by the CEO of Apple Computer, who publicly announced that he's gay. I mean, he did that 2012, I think. And when I was reading uh, his article, his writing, and uh, he used this word activist, and right away it flashed on the inside of me, that's it. I'm an activist for Jesus. There are too many activists for the wrong reason. You need to be activists for Jesus, for the kingdom. You need to be a world changer. You need to affect and influence the people around you. Your household, your clan, your ethnic race, the people around you. Don't just live for yourself. If you just live for yourself, you won't be successful. The passion, the desire to win people to Jesus, the passion, the desire to grow God's church, to promote God's people, to build a strong army for God, that's the ingredient for success in your life. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. God will talk to you. He is the God who teaches you to profit. God wants our life to be profitable. It doesn't matter how old you are. Don't, please, listen to me. Don't think about retirement. You are always too young to retire. You may retire from making money, but you must not retire from serving the Lord. In fact, I've had the Lord saying to me, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. There are people working and working and working till they're 70 year old and 80 year old and still don't have time to serve me. And then when they stop working, they say that they retire. So they've never served the Lord. The calling on your life is to serve the Lord. You've spent so many years serving your boss. You've spent so many years serving money. What about serving the Lord? You've spent so many years serving your children. And now you do it again in serving your grandchildren? Isn't it time to stop? When you go to heaven, you stand before Jesus. How many, time, how many years have you spent for me? Let me see, maybe add up all together a year. Out of 80 years of your life, time is very, very expensive. Time, your time is your life. Your time is your life. Why are there only a few people in the prayer meetings? Because everyone is working. Working, making ends meet. Working, making money. Doing something else. Your priority is very, very important. And God wants us to have His priority of success. His success is that we make money efficiently. How many of us love efficiency? How many of, lo how many of us love to make a lot of money but just spend two hours? <laughs> That's what I want. Praise God. I don't want to work hours and hours and hours and make only a few, a few bucks. <laughs> efficiency. Let's believe God for efficiency. Let's believe God for efficiency. Not toiling, not toiling, not toiling. His grace is sufficient for us. Amen. You need to pray this. His grace, His grace, His grace is sufficient for us. Can we say amen? Thank you, Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit, that's the number one sign. Number two, a life of meaning and direction. Number three, how do I know that I have the presence of God in me manifesting powerfully? There will be testimonies in your life. Amen. Testimonies every day. Answers, solutions, provision. All the time. Amen. I've started writing testimonies every day. Amen. I've had so many testimonies in my life. All the time. Wherever I go, even when I went to Cairns, every day I had testimonies. Amen. Why? Because you carry the presence of God. You host His presence. Answers, solutions, open door. Thank you, Jesus. Testimonies. Number four, a life of glory and power. All these are progressive. And then you see a life of glory and power. First Chronicles 16, 27. Glory and power are in his presence. First Chronicles 16, 27. You see, God has his book of testimony. That's why it's called a chronicle. Glory and honor are in his presence, strength and gladness in his place. How many of us want glory and honor? Lift up our hands. How many of us want strength and gladness? Lift up our hands. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, how do I get into the presence of God? How do I get his presence? Number one, every one of us should know this. Get born again. To be in the presence of God, your spirit has to be born again. So your spirit is not dead to God. Your spirit is alive to God. Before you got born again, your spirit was alive to the devil. And that's why a lot of people watch ghost movies. A lot of people go to cows because the spirit was alive to the devil, but dead to God. But once you're born again, your spirit gets alive to God. That's how you get his presence. Number two, you get into his presence. How? 
by faith. By faith. Number three, how do you get into his presence? By dedication. As I said, a lifestyle of dedication. Every day spending time with God. Oral Roberts, before he went back to heaven, people came to ask him, how did you keep yourself so strong? He, he only went to heaven when he reached his 90s. And he was full on serving God. And people asked him, you know why? You know what kept you so strong? Your desire for God, your, your, your power, your spirit, your fervency. He said, I would never allow anything nor anyone to take me away from my time with God. He's a dedicated server. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Number four, by experience. Experience is very, very important. God teaches us a lot by experience. Your experience of his presence is very important. Your experience of his signs and wonders and miracles is very, very important. It's like because I've had so many healing experiences, you can't talk me out of healing. I've had a lot of provision experience, you can't talk me out of God's provision. The presence of God, the flesh, the word became flesh. That's experience. You need to ask God so that you can experience Him more. It's not enough just to hear. It's not enough just to have faith. It's very important you experience. What changed Job? If you read the book of Job, what changed him? The presence of God. The minute God showed up, the minute he experienced God, everything changed. That's why it's so important. You can't afford... You can't afford not to hunger and thirst for God's presence. Make time for fellowship. Amen. Make time for fellowship. Let me give you a few tips if you live a busy life. You can spend time in the presence of God. I do this myself while driving. I multitask a lot. When I drive, I listen to songs. I listen to sermons. When I drive, I pray. When I drive, I also pray in tongues. Now, I have, to, I have to say to you, you still have to be, you know, make sure you're driving. <laughs> I'm not saying that you don't, you don't drive. You drive, but at the same time, you can listen to sermon, you, sermons, you can listen to uh, songs, you can pray, and uh, all this, you know, while you're driving. And another thing is like, for example, during our praise and worship practice, I don't see it as a practice. I see it as my time with God. So even when we're practicing, I'm having time with God. I'm in His presence. And even now that when I'm preaching, when I'm teaching, I don't see it as my task. I see it as I'm in the presence of God. The thing is that, you know, being a honky in the past, I was like very task-oriented. You know, a lot of Hong Kong people, a lot of Asians are very task-oriented. When I say a task, it's like I'm doing it. And I wish that at the end of the day, I finish all my tasks and then I can spend time with God, you know. I remember when I was a new Christian, every day I would just quickly do this, quickly do this, you know. I, now you ask me, I don't understand how I could cook so many meals in those days. <laughs> I don't know how I did it. But <laughs> I was able to do it, get up in the morning, take them to school, you know, drive them, you know, to this and that. And then have the lunch ready, have the dinner ready. And I was like rushing all the time. And I found that, you know, the time that I could have to myself was the time between dropping them at school and then picking them up at 3 o'clock. Like 3 o'clock is my, it's like Cinderella's 12 o'clock, you know, to me. <laughs> and then the Holy Ghost just taught me, the Holy Ghost said to me, don't do that. <laughs> he got my attention. I said, what? What do you mean? What do you mean? He said, when you're taking care of your children, you are in my presence. When you're cooking, you are in my presence. When you're, gro when you're grocery shopping, you are in my presence. Whatever you do, you are in my presence. Amen. Do you get this? Do you get this? It is not a task then. It's enjoying the presence of God and learning from Him. Amen. Whatever you do, involve Him. Another word is, involve God. Whatever you're doing, involve Him. Amen. Anything that you're doing. For example, like if you're doing a PowerPoint, I'm talking to Chandra, 
involve God. <laughs> Amen? If you're playing the keyboard, involve him. Whatever you're doing, involve him. I'll talk about this on Sunday. You have to understand that we function in two places all the time. We have bi-location. We're in the natural and in the spirit all the time, and you're shifting all the time. How many of you have uh, operate with a multi-screen when you're doing on, you're on the computer? So you bring up one app, and you bring up another app, and you bring up another app. Or you can do one document, and then you do another document, and you're doing it at the same time. You pull up one, and then, then you go back to one and pull up another one. That's the way we function as Christians. That's the way we function. So you're naturally spiritual. You're in the spirit, and then you're in the natural. You're in the spirit and in the natural, and it moves very smoothly. Amen? Because that's how that we are designed to be. Because the spirit is to empower us so that we can manifest in the natural. If all you have is just a spiritual life and your natural life is a disaster, sorry, you haven't got it yet. You may even pray prayers, wonderful, great prayers. But what did Jesus say? Jesus did not say, by their prayers you will know them. What did Jesus say? By their fruit you will know them. It's by the way you live your life. So your spirit should empower your natural life. They are not separate. They are not separate compartments. They should be together all the time. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So I'm giving you some tips if you're busy. All right? And uh, let me get into some obstacles that we need to get rid of. Do we have time for that? Are you enjoying this? Yes. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay. Answers to obstacles. Your number one obstacle is your feelings. I fell into this trap myself, as I told you just now. I didn't feel the presence of God. I didn't feel happy. I didn't feel anointed. I didn't feel that Sonny loves me. <laughs> the other day, I said to Sonny, I said, Sonny, the Lord told me many, many times in my heart, very, very loudly, that you love me very, very, very much. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do hear God very strongly in your heart. Yes. So, it's not your feelings. Amen? Very, very important. Okay? So, stir up in yourself holy emotions. You know, sometimes I have the anointing all over me, and the Lord would like, give me remembrance of how sunny, how good he was to me. Like every time before he left the house and went back to Thailand, he would clean up the house. He would clean up all my sink, clean up all my dishes, put them back in the cupboard, everything, before he left for the airport. And uh, the Lord just reminded me, and I said, oh, yeah, praise the Lord, thank you. But I haven't told him, so. <laughs> God is very, very real, you know. God is very, very real, praise the Lord. So God will, that's how the Holy Spirit works. He will stir up in you holy emotions. If you remember something bad about somebody, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's the devil. Okay? The Holy Spirit will always show you something good about somebody. And if he shows you something wrong, he won't show it as like a, in, a condemn, in a condemning attitude or with a condemning tone. He will show it to you so that you become so compassionate that you will pray for that person. Do you get it? Another obstacle to the presence of God is a judgmental attitude. We all know what we're talking about. A critical and a judgmental attitude is like a voice that follows you. And it's like you see the bad in people. You see the negative in people. But you, you, uh, what am I trying to say? Now, uh, I, oh, the Lord will show you, how do I put it? The Lord will warn you if there's something wrong with that person. Let me put it this way. The better way to say it is something's wrong, but not something's bad. If there's something wrong with the person, God will show it to you so that he will protect you. 
You know what I'm talking about? He will protect you, but not for you to attack that person, not for you to condemn that person, but just to protect you so that you don't, you know how we Christians, we can be so gullible. You know, we believe in everything, believe in every person, and, and we get burnt. So the Lord will protect us like David was protected from Saul. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so there's a warning. Uh, there's a warning, but we have to discern that, okay, from the voice of the devil. Another thing is um, obstacle. Where am I? Another, another obstacle, um, I was talking about holy emotions, okay? So you have to identify the source of your feelings, whether it's from your flesh, from the devil, or from God. And we want Bible-generated emotions. Bible-generated emotions. So when you read a scripture, that scripture generates emotions in you. You know what I'm talking about? That generates faith, generates joy, generates peace. You know, there's, a, there's emotions. Emotions generated compassion by the Holy Spirit. All right? And because you deal with your emotions and you deal with the roots of the problem, the source of your feelings, then you can be genuinely and thoroughly positive. Now, when we talk about being positive, we're not just talking about on the outside, I'm positive. I'm confessing all the positive words. But on the inside, there's a lot of fear and anxiety. Now, it won't work because there is no unity within you. There has to be unity for God to work. So there has to be a unity between your spirit and your soul, and then your body comes in. So that's why it's very important. If you find a problem, you really need to go to the problem, go to the source of that problem, the root of that problem, deal with the emotions that have been generated in you by the problem, deal with the actions that you've taken because of the problem, and then go deep, deep within you so that genuinely on the inside, you're okay. You know what I'm talking about? And how do you do that? I've done this myself before. What you can do is that get a piece of paper and a pen and just write it down. What is troubling you? What's the problem in your life? How are you feeling now? Why are you feeling like this? Are all these feelings from God? Are these feelings from your flesh? Are these feelings from the devil? Yes, I identify these feelings are from the flesh. Yes, from the flesh. Okay, then why? Now, you have to understand that the devil has to work with the flesh. Without the flesh, the devil can't function. So you, the flesh is what you can do about. So find out why. Why am I feeling this? Oh, because there's fear. Oh, because there are grudges. Oh, because there's resentment. Oh, because there's deep-rooted unforgiveness. Oh, because there's bad memory. You know what I'm talking about? You have to do that. You have to do that. It's just like when we do um, algebra. How many of us like to do problem solving? Yeah? When you do problem solving or when you do algebra and equation, you have to find out why. So from one to step two to step three to step four to step five, and then you go from layer to layer to layer, and then you go to the root of it and get rid of the root. And that's how you know genuinely on the inside now you are being positive. Do you know what I'm talking about? Am I helping somebody? Okay? Because you have to understand that if you don't deal with them, they will eventually explode. Suppression is not the answer. Transformation is. Christianity is not about suppression. Christianity is about transformation. And one thing that I've learned, in order to have the presence of God manifesting powerfully in your life, you must never look at somebody else. Somebody else is never your problem. You are your own problem. If you can deal with yourself, it's just like a healthy person. You don't have to be afraid of the virus because you're healthy. I've learned that, yes, a lot, uh, you know, being a, having a healthy body, maybe it has to do with sleeping well, it has to do with uh, eating well, it has to do with taking care of yourself. I notice one thing is that your enzymes and your hormones has a lot to do with your health. Enzymes and hormones. Because your body is very, very, uh, is a mixture of a lot of chemicals. 
And the doctor can give you a prescription, one, two, three, but there's a lot that God can do for you, you can do for yourself. A lot is in how you feel. Your feelings have a lot to do with your health. You know what I'm talking about? I'm getting, I get this by revelation. Your feelings has a lot to do with your health. Your faith or your doubt has a lot to do with your health. Very, very important. But once again, the root, don't say that it's somebody else. Don't say that it's somebody else. Don't say that it's somebody else. Because God is righteous. If it's somebody else that's calling, that's causing your problem, then how can you be in charge of your life? But God has created us in such a way that we are accountable for and that we can be in charge of our life. And in order to do that, I don't make myself a victim. You're not a victim of how somebody treats you. You have to be a leader for yourself. You lead, number one person is yourself. Lead yourself into the presence of God. Where is all the answers? Don't ever talk, don't ever think like you are a victim. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The minute you start thinking that you're a victim, you will be. Because the devil will make sure that you will be a victim. So you must get rid of that victimized mentality. Get rid of that victimized thinking. Why? Because it is written, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So the answer is in you. That's why before God, when we go to heaven, we will stand before God and give an account of my life. What I do with my life, not what somebody else is do with my life. I want you to understand that everything that happens in your life, devil can use it, how? To take you away from your love walk. Because if he can take you away from your love walk, you're finished. Because faith worketh by love. And if he can get rid of your faith, get you to focus on the things that you can see, then also you're finished. Because without faith, we can't do anything. So faith and love. Faith and love. Faith and love. Don't ever. That's why the Apostle Paul said, let nothing separate me. Let nothing separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So that's all for feelings. Number, number two, obstacle. The word and faith factor. Number one, unbelief. Unbelief can be due to a lack of understanding. That's why coming to Bible study is important. Listening to sermon is important. And that's why God has given you a teacher. And number two, unforgiveness. I talked about that, the walk of love. All right, getting into the presence of God and having the presence of God manifesting in our life. A very, very important uh, obstacle that we need to get rid of is problem consciousness. If you're always conscious of problems, always conscious of problems, you can't get into the presence of God. Not to say manifesting the presence. Not even to say manifesting the presence. Another obstacle is self-consciousness. What am I talking about? I'm talking about that everything that happens in your life is a reflection on yourself. It's a reflection of whether I've failed or I've succeeded. You need to get rid of yourself. Don't see everything as a reflection of yourself, whether I fail or whether I succeed. What does it matter? Not everything is a reflection of you. Amen. Parents, if we see our children do well, then it's a good reflection on me. If they don't do well, then it's not a good reflection on me. No, you can't function like that. Because that is self-consciousness. Once again, it goes back to who? Self. <laughs> so two obstacles, problem consciousness, and self-consciousness. Why? Because the presence of God comes by grace. We can't earn it. We don't earn it. So as soon as you get into that earning mode, you won't get it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It's by grace. That's why the presence of God comes very quickly with thanksgiving. Amen? 
Well, how do I know that I'm self-conscious? Let me give you a few signs. It's like just going to the doctor. The doctor will tell you that you're like this, like this, this, and that's why, you know. So let's look at a few symptoms that you know and you get rid of it. Number one, if you're uptight, you can never relax. You're always uptight. Number two, fear and anxiety. Number three, cares and burdens. Number four, an overwhelming mindset. Number five, overwhelming opinions. Like heavy, making you very, very heavy. So how do I do that? How do I get rid of them? You rebuke them. Amen. Say to yourself, lift up your hands with me right now. Say with me, Father God, I give you thanks. I give you praise. Your grace, your grace is sufficient for me. Your strength is made perfect in my weakness. Amen. And then dance around, shout around. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's finish with Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 11. Self-consciousness is our worst enemy. We need to be God-conscious instead of being self-conscious. I enjoy all these gadgets, you know, tablets, phones. But I've noticed that one of the um, new uh, sickness, city sickness of these days, present generation, is addiction to these things. You see people reading them all the time. It's like you can't get it off their phone. You can't get them off their phone all the time. All the time. It's an addiction. You need to notice it yourself. And if you know and you know that you are addicted, you need to cut it off. How many of us lived in those days when we had no mobile phones? Yeah. We're living in a time and a generation when everything seems to be in a hurry. It's like, I've always to be in the loop. I'm always hurrying. I need to be in touch. I need to do this. I need to do that. Well, we have the church mobile. We have the apps. But you can turn it off. You need to manage your time. You need to, I'm, I'm going to ask Daphne to explain that on Sunday. You can turn off the apps individually and turn them back on again. You need to manage your time. You must not be addicted to your phone. Amen? You can't. How can you get into the presence of God? You can't. Amen? You can't. You, you really need to manage these tools. You can have all the minors, but then you lose the major. Can we say amen? Amen. Very important. You must prioritize your life. And honestly, nobody can tell you what to do but yourself. We're all adults. Amen. So you need to tell yourself what to do. Can we say amen? Psalm 16 verse 11. But being a teacher of the Lord and being your pastor, I'm here to tell you. Psalm 16 verse 11. This is David. You will show me the path of life. This is a statement of faith. When you pray, say, Lord, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. This is the most important in our life. The vital ingredient for winning prayers, the presence of God.